Cascading Style Sheets, or CSS, is a web standard that is put forth and supervised by the World Wide Web Consortium, or W3C. This is also the governing body who is involved with HTML, XHTML, and HTML5. There are three versions of CSS. The first version concerned text and page formatting. The second version introduced positioning and other visual effects. The third version, which is still under development, introduces many other visual features. Although it's still under development, it is many of these features are implemented in the browsers, and we will be looking at some of them in this class. There are three ways to apply a style. The first is what's called an inline style. This is what we've been looking at so far. In this class, we will learn about embedded styles and external styles. The inline style is coded inside the, the tag or element. It only applies to that specific tag or element in that specific instance. For example, we have been looking at calling a CSS property and setting a value to that property using the style attribute, which is an HTML attribute, called from within pretty much any HTML element inside the body tag. And here we see an example of calling two properties. And remember, property the property value pair is separated by the semicolon. An embedded style is applied to a selector. There are many types of selectors, and we will look at more selectors in the coming classes. Right now, we will be looking at the element selector. So an HTML element can be used as a selector. When we apply a style to a selector, it will be applied to all occurrences of that selector in the document. For an example, if I were to apply this style, the text align center and the color red, to the H2 tag, now this H2 tag is a selector, it will be applied to every H2 element in the document. Now let's take a look at the syntax. We're inside the opening and closing style tag. Now, there are some attributes for this tag, and they are not required in HTML5, but they are in the handout. The styles, the style rules, are applied inside the opening and closing curly braces. Now, you can write them down. You can write them across. Here again, the spacing does not matter. So, one advantage of using a selector is that it eliminates repetition. Supposing we have three H2 tags in our document and we wanted to make them all red, well we would get tired of writing style equals color colon red. And supposing we wanted to change it to blue, we would have to go back and change it all across the board. By using a selector, we can establish a rule once and we can change it at our leisure. Should you wish to override that, you always can do so by calling it inline style inside the H2 tag also. Okay, so an external style. An external style is nothing other than taking the embedded styles out of the document and storing them in a external file which is a text file with the .css extension. Now, we don't use the, uh, the opening and closing style tags. We just take the styles out. And I will demonstrate in that, this in the lab video. OK, so we reference the external style sheet with the link tag. This is the official link tag. It is a one-sided tag. And therefore, in XHTML, you will see the forward slash at the end to make it self-terminated. The link tag goes in the head section, and it should go on top of the opening and closing style tag. 
So here we see an example of two link tags. So let's take a look. We do need rel to tell us that it is a style sheet, and we do need href. This, this uh, href attribute should look familiar to you. It tells us the, the name of the file. Now the type is optional. It is required in XHTML, but it is optional in HTML5. Notice that we can have multiple link tags. We can have external styles, we can have an embedded style, and we can also have inline styles all going on in the same web page. Similar to an external style is an import. And essentially this is just another way of calling an external style. I don't see this syntax used that often, although you may. CSS comments. If you wanted to comment out your code for whatever reasons, for testing or for making notations, it is the forward slash asterisk for the opening, asterisk forward slash for the closing. And that can be a single line or multi lines. Okay, so the advantage of using style sheets is that most web pages have a similar look and feel or at least they should. And so rather than coding the same thing over and over again, we can develop a set of styles, store it in an external file, and we can apply that style sheet to many pages. Therefore, should we need to make a change, we only need to change it in one place. This also gives us the ability to separate the content from the presentation. The presentation is all contained in the style sheet. Therefore, should we wish to write another style sheet for a portable device or another type of device, it is very easy for our website to be able to be, be viewed in that device. Also, by separating the content from presentation, it makes it much more easy for screen readers to interpret our HTML and also for other computer-based programs. Now, we also can have several styles applied to one document. And all of these styles would apply, provided, of course, the elements or selectors exist in this document. All right, so which style takes precedence? Well, as I just said, they all are applied. But in the case of a conflict, and by a conflict, what I mean is, supposing I had a color specified for the H2 tag in an external style sheet, and then I changed that color in the embedded style sheet for the page. We have a conflict. So which value would take place, would take precedence? Well, the closest style takes precedence. So here we have our cascading order of inheritance of precedence, which is why it is called cascading style sheets. We also have this concept of inheritance, um, and it essentially means that children inherit from their parents. So we, if we look at the P tag as containing a B tag, well, the P is the outside tag and can be looked at as the parent. The B is contained inside, so it can be looked at as the child. All of the text inside the B tag would all obviously be blue because the, the, the rule is for the paragraph to be blue. Okay, speaking of blue, how are we assigning color values in the HTML document? Well, there are three basic ways that we are assigning it. Now, CSS3 gives us some additional ways, and I have it included in the handout. We're looking at an RGB triplet, a hexadecimal value, and a color name. When it comes to using a color name, you want to use the 16 basic colors. There are many other color names, and they, are, they do work, but they're technically not supported. You're not supposed to use them. All right, so an RGB triplet is based on red, green, and blue values. And here is the syntax for the RGB. Um, each value of 
red, green, and blue would have a range from 0 to 255. And actually, that gives us the ability to see 16.7 million colors, which is beyond the capacity of the human eye. The hexadecimal value, on the other hand, is based on RGB, but those RGB values are converted into a base 16, which is a hexadecimal value. And you will see the numbers between 0 and 9 and the letters between A and F. So here we have um, the 16 basic colors, which these names are fine, and you also see their RGB triplet and hexadecimal equivalent. Okay, so the images that are supported in the web page are the GIF, GIF, JPEG, JPG, and PNG, PNG formats. Even though you may upload a BMP and it may work, it is not technically a supported file format, so it is not wise to use that. Images must be what are called 72 DPI at a 72 dot per inch resolution. And I have some more information and a tutorial on the handout showing you how to convert. Lastly, one of the things that is commonly done with images is alignment. Images can be aligned to each other or to text. We have these, um, the vertical hyphen align CSS property. And these are the different values that allow us to align images.